Hey everyone, welcome back. And in this video, I'll be sharing how you can create a highly scalable video delivery infrastructure and pretty much show you what we do at CodeDAM. If you have seen any CodeDAM course, you know we have videos embedded and interactive exercises embedded as well. But if you closely look at the videos, the videos are not embedded from YouTube, any other third party player, for example, but they are custom optimized and delivered as well. So in this video, my motive is to how, not only just how to deliver, but how to create this full pipeline. And this will involve a lot of infrastructure, architecture, and I know a lot of you have been asking me this for a very, very long time. So let's just go ahead and see how we can create one. Also, if you are new here, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel i'll be doing more such videos live streams and things here and yeah i mean if you don't want to miss it make sure you hit the bell icon subscribe to the channel and also like the video it helps feed the algorithm okay so video processing where do we even begin the first thing you have to realize is that your video, whatever you're trying to process and put in front of the user, it has to be optimized in a certain format. The reason for this is web currently does not support every single video, right? And most of your videos, for example, this video which I'm shooting in 4K 60 FPS is 4 GB for 10 minutes, right? And this is exactly not what you want or what you're watching on YouTube, right? So YouTube is also processing this video in some format. That's why they are able to deliver it to you so fast. Your internet connection, I hope, is not something which can afford 4 GB per 10 minutes. I mean, even if it could, it's not worth it, right? So what you want to do, first thing is that you take up the video which the person has. Let's say this is an MP4 video. It could be any any single format and the first thing is to upload it to cloud right so the very first thing you would want to do is create a signed s3 url now what is a signed s3 url aws is huge right they have a lot of capacity for compute storage and everything so what aws allows you to do is it says that okay we have our s3 bucket here right it is a bucket and it can virtually store a lot of data i won't say unlimited because nothing is unlimited but it can store a lot of data you cannot even imagine so what you do is you ask s3 that hey give me an address a signed url where whatever i put anything it just uploads right so the compute is s3 the uh, infrastructure is of s3 and you don't have to worry about what's the file size here it could very well be one terabyte it could be very well one megabyte, right? If you route it through your own server, then you have to make sure that your server is able to handle file of that size or you know, you're streaming it properly to S3 then, but so on. But what you do is you create a signed URL from S3, which is AWS, and then you upload it to an S3 bucket. Upload it to S3 bucket. This is where the fun begins because now you have this on the cloud, right? And I'm going to stick with S3 and AWS and AWS infrastructure because that's how we have deployed our pipeline at CodeDAM. But you can pretty much choose any cloud provider. I believe most of them will provide some sort of functionality like this. Now, what S3 allows you to do is it allows you to link a bucket with a service called SQS, which is a queuing service from AWS, which stands for simple queuing service. So this means, let's say if I have a bucket which stores file number one something something file number two something something so on what it can do is on the next on the next upload whatever it is right it, it could be a video file it could be anything this s3 bucket can add a message to this queuing service and this sqs is just a simple queue right where you read the message and you know you can push the message as well you can read and push read and push so like a queue works, you have, and queue is a data structure. Data structures are super important, but not for competitive coding only. I have created a video on competitive coding versus software, so maybe you want to watch that as well. But anyway, what happens here is that you add certain elements and you can take them out from the front. This is, this is what SQS does, but the only good thing, or you know, the only major reason you should use SQS over implementing your own queue is that this is highly scalable right this is highly scalable for receiving tons of messages or tons of inputs every single second as well which you're probably your data structure would struggle to do but anyway what you want to do is every single time an item is added to this s3 bucket you want to push, push a message to this sqs and this is inbuilt behavior with aws right aws provides this that whenever a file is uploaded here a message gets added here right so this could be a message right this could be a message this could be a message. Let's say I uploaded three videos together. So this queue has three messages. And that's it. That's where the job for S3 
ends, right? Now, AWS also provides you a service known as CloudWatch. And what this CloudWatch can do is you can set an alarm inside CloudWatch to do certain action whenever the queue size is greater than zero. So you can create an alarm in AWS that whenever the queue size is greater than zero, I want to do something, right? Or if the queue size is equal to zero, then also I want to do something, right? These are the two actions which we need in CloudWatch. And I'm gonna tell you why we need these two actions. This first action right here is responsible for launching an EC2 machine. So that means whenever the queue size is greater than zero, what we want to do is we want to launch an EC2 server. Now this EC2 server could be a powerful server as well, it could be a mini server, whatever this is. But this server has two jobs. The first job is to actually read a message from this queue, right? So this queue is there. It wants to read a message from this queue. And I, I told you like we uploaded three files, so three, two, one, for example. What this EC2 server did is that it just read the first message. So it got this first message right here and it started processing this video file, right? And what happened was this message actually contained the path to the S3 bucket, right? So this EC2 machine knows where it needs to go and download that file, that particular file. So it processes it. EC2 just launches FFmpeg, for example, we use FFmpeg for processing. You use FFmpeg and convert this into three, four formats, whatever you want. For example, 1080, 720, 360. If you want adaptive streaming and HLS and stuff like that, all of that can happen right here inside this EC2, right? Because it has got access to the main file via S3, which you uploaded here, right? So the moment you do that, this EC2 now has access to this MP4 file, which you uploaded, right? In a highly scalable way. There is no component here which could break down or collapse under load, right? Given that AWS in itself isn't down. And of course, this does not has redundancy built in. So if, for example, SQS is down, you might have a loss of message and something like that. But those things we are not discussing. We are just discussing, let's say if AWS is up and we don't have any redundant systems, what, are, what is the minimal setup which you need? So once you have SQS, delivered this message to EC2, for example, and I'm assuming you are choosing a sufficiently EC2 size so that this does not bottleneck or, you know, you maybe can reject just files over 10 GB or 20 GB, whatever. You process it with a tool like FFmpeg and create certain resolutions. The next thing is you upload them back to a production S3 bucket, right? So for example, this is your production S3 bucket. And because you have processed a single video, right here, you can just upload them back here and update any database entries. For example, in our case, we link that video to a particular video in the course, right? So you can update any database entry. Once you do that, and you also have your video files processed in the production S3 bucket. Now this S3 bucket can sit behind CloudFront, right? CloudFront is a CDN service from Amazon. So all the traffic which receives, for example, for that video, needs to go through CloudFront where you can create these signed URLs and cache this stuff right here on the CloudFront for faster speeds, right? And then CloudFront can access it in a secure way from S3. So that is pretty much all it takes. The important part here is that one EC2, or depending on how you want to architecture it, in our case, what we have done is one EC2 gets launched every time the queue is greater than zero. And what do we mean by that? That means every single time this is running like one per once per minute or once per five minutes. And every single time queue is greater than zero, one EC2 gets launched. This EC2 takes up one message from the queue, tries to process it. If it is successful, then this message is permanently removed. If this fails or something happens, then this message goes back and it's retried again after some time, right? It goes back at the end of the queue. If this keeps on failing, then we have another concept of dead letter queue, DLQ which is something different, which just stores all the failed videos in case somebody uploaded a text file, for example, then of course that will fail multiple times because it cannot be processed by FFmpeg. But yeah, once you do that, this EC2, second EC2 is able to pass the second file right here. The third file is passed by another EC2 and so on. So you see what we have done essentially is distributed the compute part inside multiple EC2s and distributed the storage part and not exactly distributed but offloaded the storage part to s3 because s3 we know is solid right s3 has sla of 999 i think five nines right 
and this is like a solid guarantee that your files would be available for this much time i'm not sure if this is the exact number but something like that similarly the compute part ec2s a single ec2 is handling a single file it can take 5 10 minutes and be done with it and deploy it to s3 that is fine right here we use the auto scaling group asg which creates all these multiple ec2s right so the cloudwatch alarm is bounded with this auto scaling group which increases the amount of ec2 instances and whenever these ec2 instances is launched this this is launched from a template which knows what it needs to do right a snapshot a template whatever you want to call it thanks to this asg group and once that happens it reads it from sqs processes it deploys it to production s3 bucket which then is read, readily available for serving to end users right so now if you go to any code damn course page for example you will see that you have an option to switch between 720 1080 364 80 qualities right so that is because we have formatted it into four formats and del delivering it via s3 right all right so we have discussed q greater than zero for q equal to zero what happens is that this is zero like i said if there is truly no video to process and this is also zero if all of the ec2s for example we have two EC2s which are processing two videos right then also the queue size is zero right because there is no message in the queue which needs to be processed right so this is where we are hitting this condition and at this condition what we want to do is we want to attempt to delete these instances because queue size is zero then the auto scaling group this ASG ASG and my handwriting is really bad but this auto scaling group right here it should try to downscale the ec2s the pool of ec2s it owns right this asg owns it and therefore it tries to downscale it downscaling i mean it tries to destroy these instances which are present but there is another thing which we can do here is we can protect this ec2 instance from being destroyed by setting a deletion lock right so ec2 instances can set a lock like this where auto scaling group will not be able to destroy it and when we will do it just before the processing starts right so this is the processing phase this is the lock and once the processing phase is over then you just unlock the ec2 instance right so the moment you the video is processed it's done then you unlock it and asg sees that hey there are no q items i want to de you know downscale it sees that the ec2 instance is unlocked it destroys it and you get a scalable architecture which upscales and downscales depending on what is your need at the time. So this was a very high level overview of the architecture and how it works. Obviously this is more complicated in the code and how you place all the architecture bits and bytes but this is fundamentally how and what powers CodeDAM even today in terms of video processing and maybe a lot of other sites as well because this is an approach which is scalable if you want to make any changes you just need to make some changes in the ec2 scaling part and the best part is this whole process is very very cheap and i'll just quickly give you an idea why because you will see that right here uploading to s3 has a cost of zero dollars right because s3 has ingress bandwidth as free that means if you are uploading something to s3 uploading to aws cloud aws does not charge you for that then sqs sure has some fees but it's relatively lower i mean it's not that much right then let's see cloudwatch alarm also has some fees but it's again relatively lower these ec2 instances which you create need not to be reserved instances right these instances could be spot instances so what a spot instance is spot instance is additional compute capacity available to aws which they will sell at a 50 to 80 percent lower price right so if you pay for example i don't know like 10 cents an hour for an ec2 instance you can very well get it for like two cents or three cents an hour right so that's possible ec2 has the spot instance concept but the only drawback for this is aws can terminate this anytime giving you a two minute notice but for this task it does not really matter let's say this ec2 get instance gets terminated then this message this message which it took will get restored in the queue right and would be picked up by another ec2 instance later so that's completely fine so you get a very low cost here of processing on ec2 because you can have big machines processing but at a very relatively smaller cost then again this machine when this downloads files to ec2 from s3 that is also free because this is running inside aws infrastructure right so this part can be made free 
if you have EC2, then basically the infrastructure in a similar region. Finally, when you upload it from EC2 to production S3, that is also free because like I said, it's the charge for uploading it to basically S3 is zero. And the only price which you pay realistically, which, which you should consider actually, is when people start hitting your video, right? The data transfer cost, because this is where Amazon makes real money because their data charge is pretty high, but rest of the stuff is pretty good, right? So yeah, I mean, this, this model is, I think I ran some numbers and if you consider, for example, Amazon's media kit, which is a all in baked in solution for this, this is probably, I don't exactly remember what the number was, but it was close. It was definitely above 10 times, even 20 times cheaper, right? So this model, when you deploy it yourself, it's 20 times cheaper, but again, it increases the difficulty of your architecture. But if you're like me, back in the days, if you're simply free and want to experiment with this, this would actually make a great, great system architecture project on your resume, if you would like to have a job like that, for example creating a full infrastructure, full architecture design from scratch. So I hope this video was beneficial to you. If it was, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to the channel. That is all for this one. I'm gonna see you in the next video really soon.